Good afternoon. My name is Russ Lewell, and I'm very happy to introduce this European webinar from Ecolab. Uh, as always with our webinars, we do like to hear directly from you. And you can take part right now in our live poll question, which you'll see on the right side of your screen. And we'd like you to answer this question. What are your current challenges within the housekeeping department? And your options are maintaining cleaning standards, time pressures, cleaning efficiencies, eliminating pests, identifying the right products and tools for the job, and hiring, training, and maintaining the right employees. Um, and you can select more than one answer, and we'll summarize your feedback in just a few moments. As we always ask for suggestions for topics that would be interesting and important for you, one popular request was the importance of housekeeping and the impact that can have on guest satisfaction. So we're delighted to bring you that topic today. And don't forget, if you do have ideas for subjects you'd like us to cover in future webinars, please let us know. We'd also love to get your feedback to today's webinar, and at the end of today's session, there'll be a pop-up window with a short survey, and we'd certainly appreciate if you could take just a few moments to give us your feedback. I'd also like to remind you that we will be happy to answer any questions you may have, and that you can register your questions using the Q&A button that you can see on your screen. Our aim is to answer as many questions as possible over the next 60 minutes, but if there are questions we don't get to answer today, we will follow up with you via your local Ecolab representative. Also, you'll receive a recording of today's webinar via email this week, so look out for that in your inbox. Before we look at today's agenda and meet our two expert speakers, let's provide a degree of context around housekeeping excellence as a business essential. We all know that delivering guest satisfaction protects hotel revenue, but there's also an impact when housekeeping standards are not maintained. This includes damage to reputation and loss of business, but also factors relating to building investment protection and room and staff efficiency. It's clear that cleanliness is firmly tied to financial success, and even negative perceptions, like the concerns you see relating to bed bugs in the blue circle, can adversely affect profits. And when it comes to maintaining your reputation, never have we been in a more dynamic time for news to spread. As you can see here, many people make and change their travel plans after browsing social media. Amazingly, almost 90% of travelers trust online reviews as much as any personal recommendation. And while just a small increase in your online satisfaction rating can lead to a real increase in hotel income, the reverse is also true, with a single negative review costing a property up to 30 guests. You work incredibly hard to have a distinct distinctive brand proposition for your company, with values built around value for money, locations, facilities, and customer service, and housekeeping standards have a huge impact on guest satisfaction. In fact, cleanliness is a top-rated priority for hotel customers. As you can see in this survey, overall cleanliness of the guest room is the top attribute of guest satisfaction. And as you can see from the rest of the list, five of the top 10 attributes relate to good housekeeping. As the quest for differentiation in quality and service never ends, the challenges faced by housekeeping to enhance guest satisfaction also become greater, consistently delivering the highest standards of clean against more acute time pressure and hiring, training, and keeping the right employees. In today's event, we'll give you further insights into all the essentials that I've covered in this introduction. And as we look to the agenda, we'll start with the best practices of cleaning and hygiene, followed by bed bug essentials. Uh, then we'll take your questions, and we'll round out with some closing comments. Uh, so talking of questions, uh, Connie, could you please reveal the answers to our poll question right now, please? In just one moment, please. So thank you for your input to those questions as they come up uh, now. Uh, so we see uh, uh, that um, 
we have a broad spread across uh, all, but for sure hiring, training, and uh, maintaining staff is uh, the biggest one there. So you see everything is of uh, uh, concern uh, to one degree uh, or, another, uh, or, or another. So in order to provide some solutions to these challenges that you face every day, uh, we do have two experts who are perfectly well qualified to help us. Uh, so later in the event, we'll hear from Dr. Joel Olson, who is the lead entomologist with Ecolab's Pest Elimination Division. In her current role, she focuses on entomological research and project management within the research and development function. Since joining Ecolab in 2002, Dr. Olson has been involved in a number of important projects related to the company's pest elimination business, including insect rearing, product and equipment testing, training, protocol development, and the development of new technologies. Joelle is a member of the Entomological Society of Minnesota, and she holds a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree and PhD in entomology from the University of Minnesota. But first, today we're going to hear from Ian Lamb. Ian is a chemist by profession and has worked for over 30 years for Ecolab, mainly in field-based roles, providing technical support to all levels in a variety of industries, as well as leading many training uh, events for customers, especially in the area of housekeeping and hotel cleanliness. As a professional workplace coach, he has an active role in both customer and internal training and development. And away from work, he's a volunteer, youth leader, and ski instructor. So without further ado, I would say good afternoon, Ian. Thanks, Russ, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for all that, Russ, and uh, giving us some background to what we're going to cover today. So uh, let's see how we can make some of that work in our everyday lives. So as housekeepers, uh, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that there is plenty to do. Uh, and a planned approach, I'm sure, uh, is something that you try and do whenever you possibly can, uh, subject to staff shortages and uh, customers doing what customers do. So here we have uh, a general procedure for cleaning a room. First of all, airing it and removing any waste and linen and things like that. Uh, applying some products in the bathroom, then coming back into the main room to do the work in there. Finishing off the bathroom, back into the bedroom again to do the vacuuming and checking the lights and the small things. Uh, and then finally spraying an air freshener or an odor counteractant before we do our final checks. And in our experience, generally, guests will perceive the room to be clean uh, if they can smell a perfume. So <clears throat> what is cleaning? What are the five things that we can control? In Ecolab, we work very closely with this little diagram. Uh, we call it the cleaning pie chart or the five factors of cleaning. Uh, and time, as we've seen from the poll, is incredibly important. Uh, people will be asked to clean up to 16 rooms in an eight-hour shift. Uh, so cleaning products have to be effective, uh, and they need time in order to do their work. They're not very good if they're sprayed right on and sprayed off. Sometimes they do need some time to work. We can adjust temperature. Down in the kitchen, we can clean things hot. But with housekeeping, we have to clean things at room temperature. So the temperature of the room is a temperature at which we clean, uh, which is a shame because chemicals work better when they're hot. But therefore, uh, in housekeeping, we have to find ways around uh, using them at room temperature. How else can we make them work well? Then we talk about the chemical action, the detergents, the disinfectants, the cleaners that you would use. Uh, these may come ready to use. They may have dilution control systems built in for you, maybe water-fed or some other way of diluting a concentrated product. And based upon the specific challenges, the specific water in your hotel, which varies from country to country and within countries, based on the materials that we're being asked to clean, uh, we will make different recommendations for the chemicals we would offer. And finally, mechanical action. So do we use a cloth, a brush? Do we use an abrasive pad? Do we just use our hand? Do we need any mechanical action? These are the kind of things that we need to consider. 
And when we have those four factors in balance, time, temperature, chemical, and mechanical action, when we have those in balance, then we get the best clean at the best cost. That's for science. The trouble is, we have to put those things into the hands of our operators, uh, and sometimes, people being people, things can go awry. So very often we find in the procedural side of the job, often that's where we look if we want to improve things. So let's have a look at some definitions. So we talk about cleaning, we talk about disinfecting, we talk about dirt. What actually do we mean? When we're cleaning something, we're looking to get as much dirt off as we can, as quickly as possible, at the best cost, and without damaging the surface which we're trying to clean. Uh, my wife often asks me if I have products to clean her contact lenses because she doesn't like spending the, uh, the money on the proper cleaners, uh, and I have to defer at that point because uh, none of our products would be very suitable because they would destroy the lenses. So what do we mean by dirt? Uh, a little bit like a plant in the wrong place is a weed, so any substance sitting in the wrong place uh, is dirt. I guess the ideal situation to imagine may be in the kitchen where a chef would prepare a meal uh, and the minute the knife and fork is put together, uh, that beautiful meal becomes a dirty plate uh, and the plate has to be washed and put back into use. And then lastly, we're talking about disinfection. Disinfecting is reducing the number of microorganisms or bugs on a surface to a level where they're not causing us any problems. We're not looking to sterilize like we would in a hospital, but we are looking to kill enough germs so the ones that are left behind <coughs> don't cause us any issues. And last but not least, there are European regulations around what we can call a disinfectant and what we can use to, to kill germs. And local authority inspectors usually will ask for EN 1276, uh, a biocidal product regulated under EN 1276, which is the most stringent test which applies to all EU countries. So cleaning and disinfection are both important. Uh, essentially, we cannot disinfect a dirty surface, so cleaning will come before disinfection. Sometimes we can do them together, it depends, but the general rule is we have to clean before we can disinfect. Uh, and disinfection is an important part of people's lives these days, so we want to protect people from uh, infection in hotel rooms uh, and about their, their general life. So how can this, um, how can we, how can we protect people? How can we do that? Well, we can use for a start, we can use uh, a BPR registered biocide or disinfectant, uh, and we can aim at the places where people are most likely to pick up germs. Uh, the TV remote is commonly held to be probably the dirtiest item in the room. Uh, from a microbiological point of view any, anyway. Uh, sadly, the bugs are invisible. Uh, we can't see them, uh, but we know they're there uh, because the TV remote is something we call a hand contact surface, and hand contact surfaces are great ways of spreading bacteria. Uh, usually on the TV remotes, uh, these are bacteria from fecal matter, uh, so poor personal hygiene after being um, into the toilet is what one is the main reason for that thing becoming so dirty, invisibly dirty. So most of our money we spend on routine cleaning. Most of our money we spend on the routine cleaning, the daily in and out uh, grind of life, cleaning day in, day out. But deficiencies here um, may have repercussions later on. So how do we clean and disinfect a surface properly? So cleaning, any dirt that's left behind could, probably will, uh, whether it's oil, whether it's body fat, whether it's uh, even shampoo or something like that, uh, or lime scale will 
protect bacteria and other microorganisms from the effect of a disinfectant. So we're trying to clean the surface, get it back to its original condition. Then we need to rinse. Uh, rinsing is important. Uh, first off, it will remove all the dirt uh, and the detergent that we've used to remove to loosen the dirt, uh, and it will allow the surface to be disinfected. Uh, and sometimes the disinfectant can be inactivated by the detergent if we're not careful with our choice. So we have to match those two properly. But rinsing is a great way of ensuring that all the dirt is removed along with all the detergent so that we can disinfect the surface. Uh, when, we dis when we disinfect the surface, as we've mentioned before, we should use uh, a locally approved product, a disinfectant or a biocide. In Europe, it would be under the biocidal products regulations. Um, biocides, we should be using them safely. Uh, the label is a great way uh, of checking out information about the product, its use concentration, how to apply it. Uh, and local authorities, local authority inspectors, we notice now, more and more insist upon approved products. So we're still not quite ready to clean because now we have to think about the surfaces which we're trying to clean. So we have a variety of materials, especially in new buildings. Architects seem to love throwing in all sorts of new products um, or, or surfaces, glass and plastics and ceramics, uh, and mixing them all together um, to make our job sometimes uh, quite difficult. So we have to be careful. We have hard surfaces, we have shiny ones, we have dull ones, we have fabrics and carpets and soft things like that. And we have a variety of soils also. So we have protein, uh, mildew sometimes, black mold, things like that, soap scum, and a whole host of other things uh, which we are all familiar with. So the idea is to match the product against the dirt, against the water conditions, against the surface. And when we do that, we have the best chance then of getting the surface clean first time round. But in housekeeping, of course, we can't always choose exactly the products we want because we're asking people to do the job manually. So we have to think about skin compatibility. We have to think about using personal protective equipment. We have to think about making the process as safe as we possibly can. So we're looking to remove all the dirt, maintain the surface, and protect the person. So, how do we choose the right tools? When we get the best, when we get the time, temperature, mechanical, and chemical action balanced, we get the best clean at the best cost. Uh, typically, we find people often will try and accelerate that process by using something perhaps like a green abrasive pad. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, abrasive pads are color coded. White is the mildest, black is the most aggressive, and the darker the, the, clean, the, darker the abrasive pad, the more aggressive it, it is. So a green pad on a chrome surface, which we can see in the little circle there, the green pad will get you a quick result, but it will also slightly damage the surface. And every time we clean with the green pad, we damage the surface just a little bit more. Uh, and the effects of that are that the surface becomes easier to become dirty and it becomes more difficult to clean and slowly it degrades. And for things like chrome, that, that's a magnified image there of a chrome surface that's been cleaned with a green ab abrasive pad. And those black lines are the marks where the chrome has been taken away and has exposed the metal underneath and that surface is now destroyed because every time it gets wet, even with humidity in the air, the chrome will dissolve a little bit more. So that is permanently damaged. So color coding is a great way to help us. Color coded cloths and things like that are a great way to help us apply the right cloth to the right part of the room, to the toilet, to the shower, whatever it is. But all our abrasive items should be white. So let's have a look at the bedroom. 
There are various approaches in the industry. Uh, for instance, we talk to housekeepers about should they use a doorstop or not to keep the door open while the room is being cleaned, uh, and different companies have different ideas on that. Of course, we should not before we enter because we're not quite sure if the room is going to be occupied. And this, this is a great opportunity now, now we're in the room, is to make other people's lives easier. For instance, we could pre-spot linen if we work in an in-house, if we have an in-house laundry, we could pre-spot things like makeup stains and coffee stains on linen right away to make life easier in the laundry. This is a great opportunity as we're handling bed linen uh, and mattresses to check for bed bugs, as we'll hear later on. Um, when we vacuum, we may produce some dust, so we need to think about when we put that into our plan. And do we want, for instance, to disinfect a hand contact surface, like a light switch, uh, or like the toilet handle, uh, or like the TV remote that we talked about before? And what about glasses? Glasses, the best way to disinfect the glasses in the room is through the dishwasher in the kitchen uh, or in room service. But how would we handle the glasses? Maybe there's a compromise in there or something that we could think of uh, to help make disinfecting those things a little more simple. But what about the bathroom? Because we know that the state of the bathroom is pretty much the way by which guests will judge the rest of the hotel. So the bathroom procedure. Applying products first to the dirty areas. So we pre-clean first. Uh, that usually means moving around the guest items. Some companies have different opportunity, uh, different ideas about whether we should move guest items around or not. Um, personally, I quite like mine uh, all order that for me uh, and put in high order. So I'm, I'm, I'm all for it, but not everyone uh, falls into that category. So we do the dirty areas first because we said the chemicals need time to work. So by putting the products onto the toilet, uh, inside the toilet, onto the shower walls and spreading them around, we have the opportunity for them to do the work whilst we're doing something else. So we can do the bathroom surfaces, then we can go and do the room, come back and finish off the bathroom. So we pre-clean, we put the products on, we allow the products to work, we apply some mechanical action, some scrubbing, then we would rinse with clear water uh, and then finally dry to get rid of all the detergents and all of the water. Sometimes the disinfectant will be built into the cleaner. That's a good way uh, of helping control mold uh, and, 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 and other bacterial growth that we don't want. So let's have a look at a couple of examples uh, as thinking about some important long-term options. So we said that we spend most of our money doing the routine cleaning, the eight hours, the 16 rooms, the 15 rooms in that shift. Uh, and there are little things we can do during that time that will really make life easier for us. Uh, if, for instance, we have spots on the carpet, maybe jam or marmalade or something like that, uh, or fruit juice, if we can get to them now before they stain, they're much easier to clean, much easier to get out. Uh, and the person doing the work is in the, ideal in the ideal place to do that. So it puts off the day where we need to get in with steam cleaners and other kind of machinery, uh, which is more of a hassle. So there are different products for different kind of marks. We get water soluble things like fruit juice, we get makeup and things like that. And again, applying the right product to the right surface will help us get that cleaned. So that, that's a daily routine. Um, a longer period thing, we are learning slowly uh, that some hotel customers prefer to allow a little bit of mold to grow because they can clean their rooms more quickly and then on a weekly or a monthly basis where mold begins to grow in the corners of the grout, uh, they will use very aggressive products uh, and a lot of PPE to recover the room. Uh, that's a, a conscious choice which some people make. So some people will work on, on the daily routine. Uh, other people prefer sometimes to make the daily routine a little quicker 
uh, and to recover things. But when we recover things, we have to work much, much harder. So let's combine all that we've learned there uh, and apply it to a situation we hope we never encounter. Uh, and that is norovirus. Norovirus, we're just coming out of the norovirus season, but we're using exactly the same principles to tackle norovirus as we would to tackle any other cleaning problem. So they're the same principles, but they're exaggerated. So again, we, we're thinking the right, the right length of time, the right products, the right mechanical action, the right chemical action. We need a plan. Uh, we have to make sure that everybody knows the plan. Uh, I was in a hotel a little while ago, uh, and the staff were telling me about a fire alarm that they had one night, uh, and then they realized that all the staff pretty much staying in the hotel overnight were from a different hotel, from the same chain, but from a different hotel. And they weren't entirely sure uh, of how to work or how, what the fire procedure was in that building. So I know we train our staff, uh, but for things like norovirus and these things which can make uh, a great impact on people's lives, it's, it's good to know uh, that those plans are being refreshed. We need to think about the PPE because norovirus is an infectious agent, so there will be more PPE involved. We need to clean, and then we need to disinfect. Do we need to treat the whole room now? Do we need to disinfect all the surfaces? There will be a plan for that. And there will be extra stringent disposal and laundering procedures uh, for the foul and infected linen. So finally, as I come to a close, uh, how could your supplier help you with some of these issues? Well, for a start, they could match the products to the soil and the surface on your behalf. They could talk to you about sustainability. They could talk to you about cleaning at the best cost, not necessarily with the cheapest products. They could offer you training and advice to help you become consistent and make sure that all areas of the hotel are covered equally well. They could talk about color coding. They could talk about perhaps using task cards, which are color coded and done in pictures. Maybe they could advise you on specific issues as they arise. Uh, and maybe even if you're building a new hotel or you're changing the style, uh, we could, or a, a supplier could advise uh, before you make any permanent changes. So is it possible to develop that relationship even further? Maybe it is. Maybe we could talk about um, your guest satisfaction audits. Uh, a supplier could talk to you uh, about targeting problem areas. We could, they could work on projects for you. They could advise, they could train, uh, maybe supervisors or managers or other people. And they could talk about health and safety and maybe pest challenges. And maybe they could integrate all those things, uh, all those services throughout your hotel. So, Joel, maybe you could help us understand that. All right, thank you, Ian. So, moving into the presentation here, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna be discussing the important information about bed bug biology and behavior. So we move on to my agenda slide here. I'm going to be talking about how to be proactive about this pest, and I will include some of the best practices and things to consider when choosing a pest provider. So getting started here, I'd like to first point out that there are many pests that impact the hotel industry. Rodents can be an issue for shipping and receiving in kitchen areas, along with cockroaches and flies if there is a full-service restaurant on property. But when it comes to guest rooms specifically, most of the calls and reports we receive are actually for ants, occasional invaders, and guest rooms. Occasional invaders include things like ground beetles, crickets, and other seasonal pests that sometimes wander indoors when outdoor conditions are either too warm or too cold. Even though ants and occasional invaders are reported much more often, bed bugs are by far the biggest concern for guests and housekeepers like. This is because bed bugs are often considered more than just a nuisance to the hotel guest, and there's zero tolerance for this pest. In general, bed bug incidences are on the rise for several countries around the globe. We continue to see increases in bed bug related service calls for parts of Europe, US, 
Canada, Australia, and parts of Southeast Asia. In fact, a recent survey of the pest management industry showed that 99% of companies are now providing services for bed bugs as of 2015. This is a dramatic increase compared to just a few years prior, which is something to consider when choosing a pest provider. I'm going to talk more about this later in the presentation. In addition, 54% of pest providers agree that bedbug infestations are in fact increasing. And Ecolab in particular has seen a 14.7% increase in infestation versus the prior year. We will continue to track this moving forward. Increases in bedbug related service requests have been reported for hospitality, healthcare facilities, offices, schools, and even movie theaters. Some of the reasons for this increase are a general increase in occupancy rates, increased travel, more widespread populations of bed bugs, so chances of introductions are just higher. And finally, public awareness has really contributed to the increase in bed bugs these last few years. With this increase in public awareness, we see that 80% of travelers are concerned about bed bugs. 25% of those travelers are checking their rooms and 12% have actually canceled or changed their travel plans based on concern regarding bed bugs. Just one unfavorable online review can be seen by over 150 friends and ultimately cost you 30 customers, especially when reported on sites like TripAdvisor, Facebook, and bedbugregistry.com. An interesting statistic that was also recently reported on suggested that each bed bug situation a hotel encounters actually lowers the value of a hotel room per night by 38 US dollars. To continue on with the topic of trends for the moment, I'd like to point out that even though bed bugs are not considered a seasonal pest, we actually do see an, an increase in activity uh, at certain time periods of the year. This peak in activity usually occurs between May and September in the United Kingdom. This can be contributed to time periods when people are traveling more frequently or taking vacations, and occup occupancy rates are higher than usual. The same peak is observed for activity in the United States around this same time period. Therefore, we highly recommend taking some time in the spring to educate your staff on the importance of bed bug activity and properly train them to look for the signs of activity in order to reduce the chance that guests are finding them. This can save a lot of heartache later on when dealing with an upset guest. One of the ways to educate your teams is to provide a better understanding about bedbug biology and behavior. So let's cover that here. Bedbugs are nocturnal human parasites. They are actually considered a nest parasite, so to speak. This group of insects prefers to reside in and around the nest of their host. So in this case, the host is human and the nest is the sleeping or resting areas. Bedbugs feed exclusively on blood, and this particular species prefers human blood versus any other type of animal blood. There are bird bugs and bat bugs that look similar in appearance, but they are exclusive to their host as well. They are not associated with poor sanitation, nor do they feed on dead skin cells, food debris. They don't even drink water. They only feed on blood. And bed bugs range in size and color, so you can see here in the next few slides as well. The coloration depends on how recently they have fed. They can range from a yellowish brown to dark brown to red in color. They typically feed between 3 and 5 in the morning. And this is usually the time that the host is sleeping, it's dark, quiet, and there's little other disturbance in the room. It takes them a few minutes to find a capillary under the skin to feed from and become engorged. Immediately after feeding, they'll return to a safe harborage area located in and around the bed area. And I'll provide more details on exactly where those locations are in a moment. But first I'd like to take a minute to talk about their feeding habits. I already mentioned that this typically occurs while the host is sleeping, but they are attracted to elevated levels of CO2 in the environment from the sleeping host and body heat. The bites are generally painless and they often occur in rows or lines as you see here in the picture. They'll pierce the skin multiple times in search of that capillary to feed from. Each time they pierce the skin, this could result in a potential bite mark. Most bites occur on the upper portions of the body as these are the areas that are most often exposed while sleeping. The bite reactions vary quite a bit from one individual to the next. Most people actually don't even react at all. In fact, 70% of the population does not react to a bed bug bite. This is why bed bug infestations can go on for extended periods of time without being noticed or reported. 
However, some individuals are ve have very severe reactions, like the one you see in the photo here, resulting in large red bumps that can itch for several days and even weeks. One very important thing to consider is that bed bugs have not been proven to vector or transmit disease. So while evidence of HIV, Hep B, or C has been identified in the blood meal obtained from an infected individual, there's no evidence to prove that it can be transmitted by the bug from feeding on one infected in person and then to another. Regardless of their limited potential to spread disease, bed bugs can cause serious health-related effects for many individuals, including anemia from loss of blood to mental health issues. So let's take a minute here and talk about what bed bugs actually look like. First of all, all life stages of the bed bugs can be seen with the naked eye. A flashlight will help illuminate areas where bed bugs are hiding, but if you know exactly what to look for, actually finding bed bugs in a room can be very easily accomplished. The eggs are the smallest and resemble tiny pieces of rice. They're, they're white in color and about one millimeter in length. Early stage nymphs are the size of a pinhead, and nymphs and adults look larger after feeding and they're darker in color. Under really good conditions, so like 75, 80 degrees and um, about 30% humidity, the life cycle can take four to six weeks to go from egg to egg. A female will lay 200 to 500 eggs in her lifetime and they attach those eggs to surfaces, usually in cracks and crevices where bed bugs are hiding in groups or clusters. Altogether, they have five nymphal instars and each one of those instars require a blood meal to be able to molt into the next stage. Once they molt into the adult stage, they are sexually mature and they can reproduce. Sometimes the bed bugs themselves can be difficult to find because they hide within tight cracks and crevices. However, the evidence that they leave behind, including their cast or molted skins and the fecal spotting material is usually found right outside their harborage areas. This, is, this picture that you see here on the next slide shows the back of a nightstand where bed bugs are hiding. Um, actually, so let's talk a little bit about where they come from. Bed bugs can't fly, so they're, they either crawl or they're carried from place to place. Bed bugs or their eggs can hitchhike in a traveler's suitcase or clothing or use furniture that gets stored or moved from place to place. And the offspring of one pregnant female bed bug that crawls out of a suitcase can infest a room. As I mentioned, the smallest nymphs of bed bugs are not much bigger than the head of a pin, so they can become airborne or blown onto the bed or anywhere the infested luggage or belongings are placed. Bed bugs can live months without feeding, so it makes them particularly difficult to find or control as they remain deep within the harborage areas. Bed bugs prefer to stay near their food source, which is people in the bed, but heavy infestations can spread out to hiding places throughout the room. If the room remains unoccupied for some time, though, they will eventually move to the neighboring rooms. They can go long periods of time without feeding, and adult bed bugs can crawl rather quickly and follow conduits in the walls or pipe chases. There's no way to prevent bed bugs from getting introduced to a room, but there are ways that we can be proactive. So one of the ways to be proactive is to educate your teams so that they can provide a better understanding about this bed bug biology and behavior. So let's so let's talk here about having a trained staff. This is really your first line of defense. As I mentioned, the signs of the activity are pretty obvious, and your housekeeping staff is generally in each of your guest rooms on a daily basis. Therefore, if they know what to look for, they can help you identify bed bug activity before the next guest checks in. Some of the items to look for include blood stains on the linens or fecal spotting or cast skins and the cracks and crevices. Staff should also be looking for eggs and the live bugs as well. So here's that picture of the, of the nightstand on the bottom center portion of the screen. And if we zoom in here for a moment, if we zoom in here for a moment on this, on this uh, picture on the bottom portion of the screen, we can see where there are multiple life stages present. You can see the eggs and the nymphs, the cast skins and the fecal spotting. So from a distance, this looks like little flecks of mold and can be very obvious signs of bed bug activity. So now that you know what to look for, it might help to have a little more insight on where to look. So this is the data collected from hundreds of bed bug service calls where we asked our service teams to document where activity was found in the hotel room. The majority of the time, activity is located around the box spring, the bed skirt, and the bed frame. This is followed by the mattress area being another common spot, and then the nightstand, the headboard, 
and the carpet edge behind the bed. This distribution pattern would be different for apartments or other residual properties where we actually see more activity on the, the mattress itself. That's in more of the residential type situation. However, in a hotel, because the linens are changed on a more frequent basis, bedbugs actually see coverage areas that are a little further away from the host. So those areas like the bed frame, the box spring, and the other ones I mentioned. In healthcare facilities, we generally see more activity in the living room or other areas where potential hosts are spending the majority of their time. Okay, so now that you know what to look for and where to look, let's discuss what to do if bedbugs are suspected. First, every facility should have an action plan in place. Here's just a few recommendations on what the action plan should include. First, document the findings and if possible, collect a specimen to verify whether or not it's actually a bed bug. This will be especially important for your pest service provider because they can take a look at the specimen as well. Leave the linens, the vacuum, and any other materials that were brought into the room at the time that the activity was noted. These items should be inspected and or treated by the provider to ensure that they are not transferring activity to other areas. Next, notify management and prevent access to that room or area of the property. And finally, contact your pest provider to provide a full inspection of the room and document their findings. So when it comes to bedbugs, one of the most important decisions you will make will be choosing a pest provider. There are a few key factors to consider when choosing a pest service provider. For example, you will see on the right-hand side of the screen here that you will want a pest provider that uses an integrated, manage, an integrated pest management approach, that they offer trained professionals, they use science-based solutions, provide consistent service delivery, and most importantly, build a partnership with you and your staff. Specifically, though, when it comes to bed bugs, I recommend considering selecting a company of and individuals with bed bug service experience, and one that uses a combination of chemical and non-chemical means of control. They should include several service visits and include inspection and treatment of the adjacent rooms to ensure the infestation has not spread to other areas. And finally, a good pest provider should support you and your team by providing bed bug educational materials and additional training sessions for you and your staff to cover the basic biology of the pest and how to perform a proper inspection. As I mentioned before, the hotel staff is the first line of defense and can help identify bed bug activity before the guest. So let's discuss for a moment in a little bit more detail. It's so important to select a pest professional with experience and knowledge of bed bugs. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, this is a relatively newer pest for the pest management industry. There are a lot of companies out there that are just starting to get involved with bed bug services but they may not have the full understanding of the biology and the behavior. And most importantly, they may not understand the right tools and the products to properly eliminate this pest. So poor service can lead to additional service requests and most importantly, unsatisfactory, unsatisfied guests. In addition to selecting an experienced service provider, it's important to use both chemical and non-chemical means of control. There's no silver bullet when it comes to bed bugs and some chemistries are much more effective than others. There are hundreds of products that are out there and labeled for bed bug control. But very few of them are effective and even fewer provide long-term protection. In addition, research has proven that bed bugs can become resistant to products over time. So if the same product is used continuously for control, this is not ideal. Therefore, it's important to partner with a pest provider that uses multiple products with different active ingredients and formulations during that pro treatment process. And some items like mattress and box spring and upholstered furniture just cannot be treated effectively with chemicals alone. Therefore, heat technology is another tool that can be incorporated into services. Heat can be used to treat the entire structure or items can be placed within an enclosure to kill bed bugs with heat. Regardless of which type of heat treatment is used, ensure you're working with an experienced service provider. If not properly executed, this type of treatment can lead to damage of items or missed spots, which can result in a resurgence of the bed bug activity in that area. As I mentioned earlier, another important suggestion is to select a company that offers multiple service visits. Bed bug eggs are difficult to treat, and some stages of bed bugs can hide within cracks and crevices very well. Therefore, it's important to provide multiple treatments in order to completely eliminate the population and reduce the likelihood of resurgence. In the population graph on the, la on the left, you can see how the population quickly crashes when a three-step service is provided, whereas the population on the right decreases initially, 
but then quickly rebounds when only a single product application was applied here. And one more suggestion when it comes to bedbug services is to include the inspection and treatment of adjacent rooms. Bedbugs move around quite a bit every night. Sometimes they do not end up back in the original harborage areas around the bed. And if the host is absent for some time or the room is left unoccupied, bedbugs will naturally migrate to adjacent areas in search of a host. Our data indicates that the rooms above, below, and both sides are most likely at risk. And sometimes while inspecting an adjacent room, you might actually find that the primary infestation is actually right next door to the one that was originally reported on. It's important to inspect and treat these rooms to provide a circle of protection around the primary infested room in order to completely eliminate that infestation. And finally, your pest provider should offer additional training materials for you and your staff to help be more proactive about bed bugs. Ecolab offers a variety of materials, including fact sheets, partnership documents, and pocket cards for your housekeeping staff. These items can be found on our website at bedbugtoolkit.com. And in addition, we offer in-person training to help identify the signs of activity and prevent bedbug infestations from spreading throughout your property. So at this time, I'm going to hand it back over to Russ to handle the question and answer portion of this presentation. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, and thanks, Ian, for that uh, essential guidance that we got there. Uh, yes, throughout the call, you've had the chance to register questions, and uh, we do have a little bit of time to look at some of the questions that have come in so far. So I'm um, uh, going to start off with one uh, for you, uh, Joel, actually, because I'm sure this um, is something that concerns a lot of hoteliers uh, about clients claiming after they've left the property. So this question asks, um, I've had guests check out and then call several several days later regarding bed bug bites. Um, so how long does it take to react to the bed bug bites? Okay, yes, that's a really good question. And unfortunately, there's no way to really determine because everybody has a unique response to those bites. Um, if you remember in my portion of the presentation, I mentioned that actually only 70% of the population responds or reacts to those bites. Um, the remaining 30% or sorry 70% do not respond to the bites so the remaining 30% that do that reaction can vary from an immediate response to taking all the way up until two weeks later to respond to the bites and so there's really no way to determine whether or not that individual encountered bed bugs at that particular property or not just depending on when the bites showed up or occurred so the most important thing for a hotel to do is to make sure that they partner with their pest provider and have their pest provider perform a thorough inspection in the suspected room. And that documentation or confirmation that that room is either bed bug free or infested will be important as part of the determination on whether or not that guest actually encountered bed bugs on that property. So again, making sure it's important to to partner with your pest provider, they will help provide any documentation or support in that situation. Wow, great. So it sounds very uh, difficult to uh, to manage that, but I guess one of the other things is to make sure the guest room team are uh, staying vigilant and uh, following your tips in looking out for the signs of uh, an infestation. So great answer. Thank you for that. Uh, Ian, here's uh, an interesting uh, one. Um, uh, this um, question says, uh, I'm not sure that my odor counteractant is working anymore because um, I can't smell it when I spray it. How can that be? Ian, what do you think? That's another great question. Um, your guests will be able to smell it, uh, even if you can't, uh, because people, when um, when when they're exposed to the same perfume day in day out, uh, your brain really only notices differences. So if it's, if it's smelling the same perfume day in day out, uh, slowly it will ignore it. Uh, and we'll be turning up the um, turning up the perfume, turning up the perfume, turning up the perfume. Uh, your guests will be smelling it very severely, uh, and you maybe just about can. So the recommendation usually uh, is to change perfumes two or three times a year uh, to stop that happening. 
Okay, good advice. Great, thank you. Um, one for you, uh, Joel. Someone uh, was uh, struck by your, your diagram of the, uh, the the contamination in different rooms and so on, uh, uh, and they ask um, about their staff. How can I protect my staff when entering a room, either one with bed bugs or a room that's been previously treated? So this is a question that comes up frequently, and I think it has to do with the fact that because bed bugs are relatively new pest that not only is the pest management industry dealing with, but hotel staff are also not accustomed to this pest. And there, there is a great deal of fear about just entering a room that is suspected to contain activity. Um, and as I mentioned in the, the biology and behavior section of my presentation, um, bed bugs generally only come out when it is dark, it's quiet, and the host is resting. Um, they do not like bright lights. They don't like vibrations, they don't like disturbance in that room. So just having a staff mem member enter the room and provide daily routine services, they're not at risk of necessarily coming in contact with the bed bugs and then in fact bringing them home, which is generally the fear. Um, but one thing that I do suggest as well to, to protect your staff is really most importantly keep them educated. So this is where Ecolab or your pest provider can help you by providing um, information to your staff on what bed bugs are, what to look for, um, how to be careful about interacting with them in rooms. And if there is additional concern, um, just a general recommendation as far as PPE is concerned or personal protective equipment, we do suggest that housekeeping staff be equipped with gloves when handling um, soiled linens or other objects in the room and where they may come in contact with the bed bugs. But in general, the risk of pot potentially bringing them home is extremely low. Okay, good. That's good uh, uh, reassurance for that uh, questioner. Thank you, uh, Joel. Um, so uh, just a reminder that we, we get got quite a few questions and uh, any that we don't get to right now, we will uh, follow back with you uh, subsequently through our field uh, organization. Um, but Ian, I think your uh, discussion about the uh, television remote control, I think you mentioned it a couple of times, that has resonated uh, as well. We do see a lot of reports which say all the places that you find germs in hotel rooms um, so this uh, person asks, how can I disinfect the television remote control? As I mentioned, you, you talked about it a couple of times, having fecal matter and so on. So how can, how can I disinfect that? Yeah, that's becoming a more and more important question as time goes on. Um, there are several ways you can do it. You could do it in the room uh, as part of the cleaning. Uh, you could use something perhaps like an alcohol wipe. Uh, to, to, treat the, to treat the buttons with, um, although it is quite an awkward thing to work with because of all its little nooks and crannies. Uh, or you could use uh, a biocide uh, and put that onto a cloth and do it that way. Um, but it, that might be quite time consuming. So it may be an option uh, to do them in batches, a bit like you would descale kettles. Sometimes the kettles are taken back to the housekeeping office and treated and then replaced the next day. Uh, it may be um, that you could you could work that way with the with the remotes uh, and take them off to the housekeeping office in batches uh, and replace them uh, one maybe one floor at a time. But certainly a wipe uh, or some damp cloth uh, with biocide on it would be the best way to do that. Okay, good idea. I like the idea of the batches. I, I know a colleague who, whenever traveling, always takes a plastic bag specifically for the purpose of popping the TV remote control inside to prevent getting any cross-contamination. Um, and then la last question, I think for now, just looking at the time so we can wrap up as well. And Ian, this, um, this is one that comes up from time to time with the executive housekeepers about the will of their staff. Um, it says, some of my guest room cleaners like to bring in their favorite products from home. Uh, how can I convince them to stick to the program? Um, I guess there are several ways of doing that. Um, but these days, um, with legislation and things like that becoming much more stringent, uh, if you introduce a product into the workplace uh, which hasn't had, for instance, a risk assessment uh, and products from home because they're not designed to be used in the workplace, uh, wouldn't necessarily have a safety data sheet. Um, so right there, you're exposing yourself to um, legal issues uh, which you may not want to face. 
so your risk assessment is blown out. Um, there's no training involved, uh, and people, if you like, are stepping uh, outside the program. So I'm sure there are HR ways of dealing with that, but I guess the most important one would be um, that the, 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 legally you're, you're exposed if you're using a product for which you've not been trained uh, and for which no risk assessment has been carried out. Um, it could also be dangerous uh, if you mix products. Um, that's sometimes a dangerous thing to do. Uh, and the product itself may not, especially in the long term, be compatible with the surfaces that you're trying to clean. Yeah, very, so very helps. important. Uh, very, yeah, absolutely, very important advice. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Ian. Thanks, Joel, also for your expertise, and thank you for your questions. As I said, if we didn't get them to them today, we will uh, circle back to you uh, afterwards. Um, so it is time now to uh, wrap up. And for me, here, here are the key takeaways and considerations to maximise housekeeping as a profit driver for your business. Uh, the first is you're carrying out regular guest satisfaction surveys and pest audits uh, that will target problem areas. And then utilize your hygiene and pest management partners' expertise by asking them to help with any of those problem areas. Uh, also work with your hygiene and pest management partner to implement thorough and efficient cleaning procedures and use them to invest in training uh, because staff training is really critical in uh, reducing uh, risk and protecting your brand. Um, and say goodbye to germs by cleaning, cleaning and disinfecting surfaces, as Ian described. And uh, as Joel mentioned, be proactive with your pest uh, management. And of course, do feel free to reach out to your Ecolab Territory Manager, who is an expert in delivering superior guest satisfaction and can help out with all of these suggestions. Uh, we can also help in a number of other ways, um, so service and training personally delivered uh, directly to your uh, teams right in your very own property, specialist advice on procedures, tools and equipment, uh, BPD registered products effective against influenza virus, uh, and things like providing uh, resources such as charts and uh, signage. Uh, there are a whole host of other resources available um, to you as well, um, and uh, on the screen um, you should be able to see the links um, which you'll find in the presentation that will be mailed uh, to you in the next uh, couple of days. Uh, so finally, I'd like to thank you for attending this webinar, and as I mentioned up front, we'd love to get your thoughts about what you've heard today and ideas about what topics would be essential for you in the future too. When you leave the session, there'll be a pop-up window with a short survey, and it would be great to get your feedback. My name is Russ Lewell, and I'd like to wish you every success in delivering outstanding guest satisfaction. Until next time, goodbye.